Hello, greetings to everyone, and uh, welcome to the next episode of our Lviv International Talks by Twain Mist or your city media hub. And today we will talk about tech, about Ukraine, about U.S.-Ukraine relations, uh, and about many other good things uh, with our great distinguished guests. We have today uh, Deborah Fairlamp and Justin Zeef. Uh, who are the founders of Green Flag Ventures, uh, the, the firm that was just launched officially yesterday during Lviv IT Arena. Congratulations. Thank you. You worked, uh, both of you have experience in, in, in some, some experience in government. Uh, you have in Ukraine, it was uh, Ukrainian government. Uh, Justin has experience with American government. Uh, what would you, what was your reason to specifically focus on tech because you had a good experience with Ukraine Invest, was uh, as in the leading positions at Ukraine Invest at uh, uh, Ukrainian startup funds uh, and Tech Ukraine. Uh, does it mean that you see the biggest potential now in Ukrainian tech when we speak about startups specifically? So my my background actually is more private sector. I actually sort of had started my sector in investments and business development. So that's kind of the default to where I believe economic growth comes from. Governments absolutely play a role in certain spaces. But to my mind, it is it is the private sector where growth comes from. It's where people's individual freedom, possibilities, whatnot, you know, grow from. So the, um, the time that I had spent consulting for the government of Ukraine, I, there were very specific projects, very much aimed at bringing investments into the country. Ukraine Invest, it was more foreign direct investment, but the startup fund was was sort of something new. Um, and the the idea actually had come um, at the time Prime Minister Groisman had done a trip to Israel and he came back and he said, the Israelis, you know, the government invested in Ukrainian, or in the Israeli startup ecosystem 20 years ago early on. We want to have some kind of an investment vehicle that the government can sort of use to jumpstart the ecosystem. That's actually where you know one of the, the origins of this idea, and it was narrow enough in terms of what they were trying to do. It really was you know small grants out to carefully vetted um, companies that or startups that were being judged by a jury. You know I'll call it of their peers, but. Um, independent advisors, so there was you know, no possibility of corruption, but what it did was put infusion out into the tech ecosystem. And it was during my time, particularly with that project, that I really sort of became aware of the broader spectrum of the ecosystem that was out there. And you know, it, it, in addition to kind of the more you know, um, broad things that, that you know, people might think about. So it was just completely across the board. And Quite frankly, it, there is such a dynamic energy in in this in this in the tech ecosystem, and it is not only young people driving it. You know, there are there are absolutely folks in their their forties and their fifties who would come out of kind of the more science, um, engineering, technology background out of the Soviet Union, who have sort of led the way in terms of this. So it's a great balance of knowledge youthful energy and a desire to create their own future through companies that they themselves are building. And now, Justin, you uh, you had uh, different experiences. Uh, you worked a lot in the private sector and you came to tech. Uh, you worked at, you founded Nisos in 2014, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, why, why do you also f uh, decided to focus on, on Ukraine? Yeah. Um... I love the question because I love the answer, to be honest. Um, and I'm proud to give it, so I like giving it as often as I can. A um, bit of context background, you know, I started, uh, as you mentioned, started Nisos in, in 2014, and our objective, it's a managed intelligence firm, right? So our objective is to help large enterprise and really any clients who need it to defend themselves against groups, generally not from a specific country, but groups nonetheless who are seeking to cause damage to a reputation or to your financial position or something like that. And we found ourselves working a lot in the election disinformation space. And so over the years, um, we've been very fortunate to solve problems like, um, you know, who are the groups in country X that are working together to spread disinformation across the world? And I've always been a big believer in 
If someone once asked me, uh, why, did you, why was it so important to you to start a company that had a, a, a big mission, right? And my answer was like, I was surprised by the question. I'm like, why would you start a company that doesn't? Like, so like, why, you know, I'm, I'm a lazy person inherently by nature. And if I don't have something to stand up and fight for that really matters, it's hard for me to get motivated. Is it the same with Ukraine? Yeah, sort of. I didn't know anything about Ukraine before I, I came here the first time. Uh, my good friend, uh, Edward Marshall, um, who's a great champion of Ukraine, uh, uh, convinced me uh, to come and volunteer in, uh, in April of last year. So I, I, I showed up for, for three weeks to drive medical supplies around from you know, wherever they had been collected from, from donations overseas and drive them to the field hospitals or the clinics you know, a bit outside of Kiev, places where you go, you drop your supplies off and you get out. So um, it was Help, Help Ukraine mm -hmm. 22. Yep, okay. it was Help, Help Ukraine 22, a great organization. Um, and uh, I didn't know anything about Ukraine before that. I came, uh, I saw something that provoked a lot of different emotions in me, both towards Ukraine, the world, and my own country. Um, I, am a, I am still a firm believer in the concept of American exceptionalism, which, which is different from the idea that the United States is better than other countries. It's that the United States has a unique position and opportunity, and therefore, in my opinion, responsibility to support the world and democracies when and where we can. And, but, and so I believe that, and you know, I, and I came here uh, and I met Ukrainians and I had not really had any day-to-day -day interaction with them. And, you know, I also served uh, during my time in government, I spent, uh, I've served full deployments in both Iraq and Afghanistan. So I've spent time on the ground in conflict, zone, conflict zones. Um, and I didn't realize until I came here that you could be in a conflict zone and still care about self-determination and independence and freedom in a way that was more than we just want the bullets to stop or we just want the shells to stop, which there's nothing wrong with wanting, you know, violence to stop, but you can go further. You can decide that collectively you and your society can decide how your future looks and what kind of rights you have and that you protect for others. And I never saw that in, in those places. I didn't see that desire, that drive among the people. And I came here and, you know, first stop was Lviv and I made my way to, you know, Kiev and from there to other places. And in everywhere I went, it felt like what I imagined the United States felt like a week after Pearl Harbor, right? It was fierce patriotism without the jingoistic element of patriotism for the sake of we're better than you, right? It was just we're together in this, we are not going to give up. And if you'll support us, we will take it and we need it. And, and, and I felt it. Uh, and you know, I, 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 I do a lot of things based on, on how they make me feel. And uh, I felt like this was something important. And so, you know, I was here and I have two little kids at home and uh, two boys, uh, Simon and Elliot and I'm a big believer in act and non verba, deeds, not words. And so you can, all day long, you can change your LinkedIn or Facebook picture to have the Ukrainian flag behind your head. But are you helping or are you just demonstrating that you totally would help if you had the chance, right? And so I said, I've got to go, got to go do this. And so that was what drove me to come, but it's not what drove me to come back, right? So I met several tech entrepreneurs when I was in, in Kiev. And it was clear to me there was something there. And I, and I went back home and I spent probably eight months making phone calls and having conversations with people in the ecosystem and, and trying to provide value just to help. You know, I met people who said, if I had a contact at this organization, I could do so much more, I could help, or they could really use my product. And I, from Nisos, really, we only sell into large enterprise organizations. So my ability to call somebody at a major Fortune 500 or a publicly traded company 
and to leverage the trust that I've built with those people over time, having worked with them through Nisos, meant that I could put a deck in front of them or I could put a connection in front of them and say, hey, this organization needs some support. They don't need you know, a donation. They don't need a handout. They just need a conversation. They can prove themselves. They just need that introduction. And so I started doing a lot of that. And I was like, I knew I wanted to get into venture investing. Uh, and, uh, and that all came together. So, so you, you both have a big mission here, but also uh, you have, I think, big plans uh, for what what's your uh, venture capital film will be doing here, um, except, except this big mission to help Ukraine. Uh, what do you see? Where do you see the biggest perspectives for and what are you going to do as a venture capital firm? Sure. Um, I have many different feelings on the subject and some of them conflict with others because I worry. I try to be very, very transparent in how I feel mm -hmm. in most conversations whenever I can. And part of me wants to you know, stand up in, in the United States and say, this is not a humanitarian. Like, is it a, are there humanitarian issues? Yes, support is still needed. The opportunity and the benefit and the value that will derive to Ukraine and to the people who are supporting is in economic involvement, right? The more economic relationships we develop between our countries, both the United States and Ukraine and Ukraine and, and other democratic countries around the world, the less likely it is that there will be conflict. And, you know, Russia knows this, right? It's probably not a coincidence that when they invaded Crimea in 2014, that the Ukrainian government was in mid to late stage conversations with Shell and a few other mm -hmm. large multinational oil companies to develop you know, land in the Black Sea because Russia mm -hmm. knew once an American oil company or a Dutch oil company is set up shop, they can't, like it'd be much more difficult to invade because other countries are gonna have a quiet conversation with them about the problems that that would cause, right? And so they you know, decided to harm this economic opportunity for Ukraine. I, I think many, most people in the United States don't understand um, that, that the reason we should be supporting Ukraine, if you, if you can't wrap your head around the need to help another democracy, like you just don't care, you're tired of it. We, you know, we sold this to the American people that we were, this is what we were doing in Iraq. We sold this, this is what we're doing in Afghanistan. We did that in neither place. And I'm partially to blame for that. And it needs to be a different story here. That's not what, this is not a place, this is not Darfur, this is not Somalia, this is not the, you know, Kosovo, right? This is a very different situation. It's a democracy that just is under attack in Europe and something we did probably many people would not have seen coming, uh, you know, 10 years ago. And, and we need to, we need to build those economic bridges. And I see a tremendous amount of opportunity to do very well as an investor here by doing good. Do you agree that it might be uh, the tactics or strategy of Russians that they changed recently, that when they started hitting a little bit other tar targets with their missiles uh, in the recent weeks? So they target many uh, manufacturers many uh, companies or like fair warehouses of the companies based both by Ukraine and uh, founded both by Ukraine and, and European or American uh, uh, investors. Is it something that they may, may be trying to, uh, to hit this, this autumn and uh, uh, winter? I certainly have no idea what's in the Russians' heads, and I definitely don't know what's in their ammunition storage depot, right? Um, my guess is that they have very few weapons that, that can target with precision and that they're just lobbing something over and hoping that it hits something within, you know, a f you know two kilometer radius. Uh, and But are they targeting a specific factory or an industry or building? I don't know. Um, but would they, you know, would they seek to damage the interest and opportunity for 
foreign direct investment into Ukraine by sending mm -hmm. the message to prospective investors that it's not safe to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's certainly something they could do. I, I don't know whether that's what they are doing. Um, but in any event, much of, if not most of the intellectual property and the innovation that's taking place here ultimately ends up in the cloud and you can't bomb the cloud. So mm -hmm. I'm not overly concerned with that, right? Like if we were investing in motorcycle factories, that might be something I'm a little bit more, I'm, I'm concerned because I don't want to see Ukrainian factories and mm -hmm. the workers inside of it getting killed. But from a risk perspective as an investor, I'm less concerned. To, to your point about, you know, things actually being in the cloud, the biggest vulnerability actually then becomes people. And yes, there are issues around, it was like, you know, electricity connection, things like that. But very early on, actually, most Ukrainian tech companies adopted very quickly. You know, there was a strange sort of situation where COVID in some ways prepared everybody for remote work very quickly. And so when things happened here, there was actually every single tech company was able to absolutely maintain support even if everybody was completely dispersed because they had been dispersed over the last you know the previous two years beyond that the issues with electricity um satellite connection things like that again were were addressed quite quickly so you know from the outside investing in ukrainian tech perspective um the the, the risks have largely been mitigated in in that context and so yes i would agree that especially investing in technology right now is is a much you know it has it, there's much lower risks than most people may perceive it to be from you know from the outside uh, in the u.s at least i think it's less a question of people worrying about the risk and more them having absolutely no idea about the opportunity right, right? Mm -hmm. there's always risk i frankly i i mean i think every professional exercise I've undertaken has had a considerable amount of risk associated with it personally or professionally. And it's about risk. It's about understanding your risks and, and mitigating your risks and, the balance. and understanding the benefit, right? The risk, ben the risk versus gain calculation. And here the gain, right? Like that's the reason why we call our venture green flags, right? Because when I look at Ukraine and I see the opportunities, all I see every, point of fact that I consider or that we consider as saying, well, have we thought about X? And you think about it and you're like, yeah, that's a green flag, right? Like the indicators are present for probability of success if you bring the right recipe and the right team to the problem. And I felt early on, and, and especially when getting together with Deborah on this, that we have the precise team and access and experience that is needed to address this issue, to bring foreign direct investment into the technology ecosystem and to help those companies, you know, get out into the into the West. Yeah, that's actually another important point in terms of the, the sort of the relationship. It, it's not just bringing, you know, investment into Ukraine for Ukrainian companies. It's also helping them sort of build and then reach back out to the outside. And that's actually another piece that, that we feel very strongly about in the context of helping companies either find advisors, mentors, new client bases, do outreach, things like that to, you know, their company's target, uh, you know, wherever it is, you know, in the West or beyond kind of thing. So it's 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 actually sort of the, the flow both ways that we are sort of seeking to facilitate and that where we see this opportunity to really help with growth because we can sort of do it both ways. Can you tell more details about all these advantages, uh, gains that you see, opportunities that you see here? Because we often hear in informational space internationally that, okay, we will we, let's build a plan for investing in Ukraine after the victory. But no one knows when the victory comes. Of course, it will come. We know it uh, from our paper, but uh, never, ne no one knows when it will happen. And uh, what would you tell to those people who are still thinking, should they go and help uh, beyond just humanitarian things? If I could respond immediately to your question, I, 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 want to, I want to challenge the words that you used in your question because you described victory as something that's just going to show up and knock on the door. It's something that you take. Mm -hmm. It's something that you make happen. 
So you'll be victorious because you choose to be and because you put your back into it and you fight. And, and, I, and, and that's one of the, the most impressive, amazing things that you just feel when you're here, right? In the US, the media, it's, if it leads, it bleeds, right? Is the old saying, right? So what do you see on the news? You see a bombed out building, you see, you know, out, it plays into the tropes, the, 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 you know, the, the storyline of a broken Eastern Europe that is, you know, was cut off from the Soviet empire, but it's still sort of hanging, right? It, it never became a fully fledged thing. And that's I'm not gonna name other countries in Eastern Europe, but I, I lived in Germany for you know five years, spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe, had never made it to Ukraine. And those places are very different from like, this is not Bulgaria, this is not Romania. It's very different and it's far more aligned culturally and in every other important measurable way to the United States than really anywhere else I've ever been. And another green flag, right? And then, so you start doing your research and this is what led us to, to you know, to, to do this. Um, you know, Ukraine is ranked, uh, one report uh, I read, uh, Ukraine is ranked number four in the world in aggregate natural resources, right? Mm -hmm. You have an abundance of things that would make the Russians want to come and take them, right? I mean, nobody is taking seriously the argument that they were here to denazify the country, right? So why are they here? Is it because Putin is obsessed with reconstituting the Soviet empire? Maybe. Is it because this is where all of the resources are and the people, and because it was the last opportunity they had to come and try and do this, not knowing that they missed their window, right? I think Americans don't appreciate that. Let's say we stopped supporting you and somehow the Russians managed to get past your defenses, which you would not be giving up. They're never going to control this city or any yeah. city in this country, yeah. right? Now you want to talk about Kosovo. Now we're talking about decades of, you know, street fighting where it's going to resemble more like, you know, Northern Ireland in the late seventies and early eighties than anywhere else on, on the earth. They don't have the manpower much less the firepower to come and take something like this. So it's not a realistic scenario where there's a victory for Russia. Um, but there is a scenario where it's just dragged out and, and damages the ecosystem here, the, the, the economic opportunities here. And we want to protect those because they're worth a lot. Great. So just as to the, the why now versus why later, mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of it, there, it, as I mentioned before, it, the fact that I've been here for a number of years, I, I have, again, slightly different context and, and views, and, and I have never doubted that Ukraine was on its way to being an extraordinary, you know, economic powerhouse. It was a matter of when, you know, even as recently as, say, 2014, up until 2014, there were still huge amounts of kind of the old structure that was within so many different elements of the government, of bureaucracies, of the systems. And, and in some ways, it was the, the sort of 2014 where the, the growth in this country began to like hyper accelerate. And I'll just give you a crazy example. When Ukrainians first had access to Schengen visas, when people were easily able to start traveling to Europe, and I'm not kidding you, I could see within about a six month period how people's travels to Europe, they were coming back and they picked up new ideas. And I saw new coffee shops popping up. I saw new boutiques shopping popping up. All of a sudden, I realized that it, the, the, a door had been opened for the Ukrainians. They were able to travel, they came back and they did it here and they did it better. They, there were so many fantastic restaurants that started popping up all over the place. And so all that needed to be to happen, and, and with this particular piece, just the ability to travel. This is an extraordinarily entrepreneurial country. And once people have an idea, they figure out how to make it work here. So I have kind of seen this arc. So I have sort of never, again, to the point, doubted that there was not going to be an economic sort of boom. It's just kind of a question of when. 
And I, I have to say, one of the things that, that was a little bit difficult for me, I think Ukrainians actually often doubted themselves much more than I ever doubted them. I, I, I really think sometimes um, there's this narrative that is going on here that, well, we hadn't necessarily done it before in the past. Can we do it in the future? But, but that, that's sort of a false narrative because actually when you stand on the outside and look, mm -hmm. it's all over the place and in almost every sector. So to the, the context of the, the why now versus the, the, the later, I, the first and foremost thing is that there's just so much going on right now. There is a tremendous amount of energy. There is such a passion and a will to keep moving forward, you know, despite what's happening out in the West. And I think it almost sort of balances itself in the context of, you know, how many of our soldiers are and have been out on the front. And for those who are not on the front, feel a really strong um, moral, cultural, social, personal imperative to be doing something in the non-battle zones. And actually what a lot of that's being translated into is the economic sector. And it's, it is, you know, if they are protecting Russia or protecting Ukraine from Russia right now on the front, what many, many other people are doing is building Ukraine's future going back to the West. And, and so it's happening, whether somebody on the outside sees it or not, you know, I, I that's actually always been a challenge with, with, it's, it's so hard from the outside to see what's happening in a, in a, you know, if you are not there. So one thing I would say, um, and actually we even just saw it this week, you know, we had brought a number of uh, Western speakers into Ukraine to speak at IT Arena. We had sort of facilitated, IT Arena paid for it and supported them and did everything, but we had just sort of facilitated some of the, the introductions to a person. All of them said, I had no idea what it would be like. And they have all been extremely moved by the people they've met, the stories they've heard, you know, the, how, how modern, great food, that it's it's a normal, lovely city that, that is happening in, in Lviv right now. You know, and Andrew, who was here before, you know, the, the air alarm went off yesterday and he talked about how, you know, there was a little bit of a reaction to it, but that most people understand, okay, the alarm goes off, you check your phone, what's the actual immediate threat? Okay, make a decision. You just keep going on with your life. It is not panic. It's not massive disruption. Like everybody has just figured out how to adapt and to keep moving forward. And it's really important for the fact that things are just going forward economically as well. Thank, Thank you for that. that. That means that your advi main advice is to come here and just, just see and feel it. It is. It's an incredibly, it, it's such a different uh, way of perceiving anything. And it's true for any country. You know, you can look at pictures online and you know, see it, but, but there is something that is really unique about Ukraine. And you, you touched on it, you know, that, that, that I think especially Americans sometimes kind of lump the whole Eastern, Eastern European bloc together. Uh, I did. And, and, and there's no differentiation, but Ukraine is, and again, this is exactly what you said, Ukraine is so extraordinarily different for a whole host of reasons um, than any of the surrounding countries. And it is when people come here and see the architecture, talk to people um, you know, on the street, engage you know, with conversations with people in restaurants, taste the food, see what's happening here, is when it's like their eyes are opened. And I have seen this going as far back as when we working with Ukraine Invest. One of the big things we really tried to do was just get people to come to the country because you almost don't have to sell it once people <laughs> are here. And I am I am not kidding you. All you have to do is get people in country in whether it's in ag, manufacturing, tech, whatever, they understand. It's so hard to articulate, you know, from far, particularly when you have screaming headlines of, you know, the, all the horrific things that the Russians are doing. But when you're here, you really understand it, it, life is carrying on in, in so many different ways. And, you know, it's that part of the population that feels, you know, the obligation to the, to the people who are fighting on the front, that that's what they're doing. And it, it's unbelievable to watch and to, it, it is actually a privilege to be here, to understand how much this society kind of works together in these balancing ways. And um, it is absolutely part of, of why I am very confident in, you know, the future of where this country is going. You know, since, you know, I came for three weeks last spring, right? I came back again with this thesis in mind um, a month and a half ago. Uh, and if you come here and you don't immediately or near immediately recognize the entrepreneurial spirit 
in the people and specifically in the comp in the founders who are putting companies together trying to solve really hard problems, then you don't know how to recognize an entrepreneurial spirit. It's extremely strong here. And I recognize it because even putting an investor hat aside as a founder and somebody who came up through the startup ecosystem, right, with next to no connections at the beginning. And um, it's, you, you know it when you see it. And, and there are so many people I've met and they're not even just founders. I've, we've sat with, I don't know how many deputy ministers or you know, chiefs of staff or folks who are in senior roles where if you were to go to many countries, why do they have that role? Oh, because you know, their uncle got them that role or uh, because it was a cush cushy government job to have. Did they care about the outcome and the responsibilities that they had? And no. Why are they bad people? Not necessarily. Nobody ever, it never even occurred to them that they should care, right? That's not what they're there for. It's just a job. But here, people have a sense of mission and duty and purpose. And maybe I'm just biased because of those are the things that I look for when I'm assessing a person's character in many ways. But it's also the, those are also elements that I look for when I would be deciding whether to hire someone for my startup or recommend them for someone else's startup. Right. And when you're sitting in Ukraine, Kiev, having lunch with a deputy minister who like pulls out an, you know, a binder and he's like, here are the, you know, here's two problems I'm thinking of right now. Like, here's a couple of solutions. Like, what do you think? Like, yeah, you don't get that in many other places. Uh, and it, so it's clear that even if you don't, right, like if, even if you don't know the exact path you're going to take, you damn well better know how to navigate and, and, and be good at it. And then it's less important if you know the path you're going to take because you'll find the path or you'll make the path. But if you're not somebody who, like there are countries in Europe where if you order a small coffee, but you ask for a medium cup because you want to take your drink on the road, the, like the smoke will start coming out of their ears. You know, well, I'm sorry, a small coffee comes in a small cup. It's like, well, but, you know, but here it's just like, okay, what's the problem? Like, let's you know, write it down. Let's solve it. Let's move forward. And it's just, I, I, it's relatable to me. And as an investor who's you know, put, taking off my hat of believing in, not taking it off, but putting on a separate hat on top of that hat uh, for the moment, um, our job is to look for investable opportunities where we have reasons to believe that that company is going to succeed. And in early stage, and really in everything in life, but especially in early stage tech, it's all about the team and it's about their motivation and why are they doing this? Because no startup pushes a product out the back end that looks like the product that they started with, right? It's an, it's an innovative process. It's an iterative process. You're learning and you're teaching as you go. And if you don't have that mindset, you're not going to produce companies or teams that will succeed. Speaking about teams, uh, Businesses need on, not only great founders, they also need good employees. Uh, do you see, because there were different conversations uh, in even in VYT Arena uh, yesterday at your panel and today uh, with a panel at was Taraskets May. So some people say that, okay, we will, we will hire because we have so many refugees. We have like five to seven million refugees out of Ukraine. Uh, we are having people with more and more people with disabilities uh, after the war, uh, after the front line. Do you, do you see this as a challenge? Uh, because companies that are aimed at growing, uh, of course, need more and more and scaling, need more and more people. Uh, do you see this challenge in Ukraine? And because some people say, okay, like yesterday to your panel, we will bring we will invite people from 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 the U.S. to come here as engineers. I didn't like that question. But. Yeah, that's why that's why I asked with you. Or today, some Taraskis May from from SoftServe says that okay, we will those people who are now abroad, they will come and bring much more competences, and they will bring, they will work even better for Ukraine, etc. What is your 
thinking about it and do you see this as a challenge? So, so I think there's actually a couple different things that are sort of within your question. So one, if you start with actually um, people who are coming back from the front and who have, have disabilities, actually, I think the, the country as a whole, the, the, there has to be a solution. Um, and there's sort of a moral and, and um, obligation in terms of helping people find ways to continue on with their lives after they come back from you know, a front end, particularly if you know, they've been injured, but before that they had been in farming and they can't do it anymore. There has to be some kind of a national uh, way to address what this issue is going to be. So that that is one piece. There's a lot of people that are actually talking about technology, um, you know, trying to find ways for people who are coming back from the front to get involved in technology if they have not already. And in fact, cybersecurity is one of the areas they're specifically trying to get people to focus because it is an area that around the world, there is not enough people for it. And so the thought is if you can train enough people in cybersecurity here, you can do work remotely. It would actually sort of be, be a bridge between a problem and a solution and an opportunity. So there, there are discussions like that that are already going on. As to the number of people outside of the country, um, I know there's a lot of angst and hand wringing about whether people are going to come back or to not. At, at the end of the day, everybody's going to make their own individual decisions. You know, if you think about it, it's a lot of women and children who had left. They probably are not going to come back until, uh, for the basis, you know, safety of children, things like that, until there is, there is safety and security. Um, but, but there's a point at which it, it's not going to be the government's decision. There's, there's really very little that a government can do to make people come back. Um, and it, so for me, it's kind of a funny dialogue because people, if somebody is living in a situation where their child is secure, where they know they can get a good education, it's the things that you're drawn to, you know, what you want for your family and to, to figure out how to get them to come back. They will come back if there are, if the, if the kind of the ground basics that they need are there. And so I think actually that is maybe a better place to focus is making, you know, on the focus on making Ukraine a place that people want to return to. So there's there's that piece of it, rather than the how do we draw them back. The economic opportunities or the challenges with building teams, um, quite frankly, that's actually not something I'm worried about. You know, I, I, I know at any given, first of all, it is extremely important for the success of a startup to have a good and balanced team. And you don't just want the small, you know, the smart engineers, you want your hackster, your, your, your hip, what is it? Hipster, hacker, hustler. It's your, it's your tech guy, it's your marketing guy, and it's your front guy who's out there selling and doing. I mean, any, any good company startup particularly needs kind of a balance of the skill sets. And it's very rare that it's one person who can do two of those, let alone three. Um, but there is an enormous talent pool that is in Ukraine. It is dispersed right now. It is. There's a lot of people who, you know, have either left or are on the front line. So is it going to be as easy as it was before the war? Okay, maybe not quite as easy to fill a position. But does that mean it's going to be the issue going forward forever? No, absolutely not. I'm not worried about that at all. And you also said one other thing about when people come back, they're going to come back with different skills and different experiences. I think that that's a brilliant thing. You know, and to my point earlier, what I was talking about when Ukrainians had access to go travel, you know, through Schengen zone without the, all of the nightmares of the visas that everybody had to go through, people went out, had new experiences, and came back with a wave of new businesses. So, I, I actually suspect that that is far more likely what is going to come back. And it's also with new attitudes. It's about customer service. It's about doing outreach. It's new ideas for how do you, you know, how do you build the client base? How do you do outreach? So. I don't see the fact that people have had to leave as something that is going to be a long-term burden for the economy. I think we can get together in three or four years and talk about it once, you know, when the war ends and the, th there's been some time for things to resettle. I, I will happily come back and have you challenge me on that. And I'm going to bet that, that I'm right, that it, the time out to coming back was a tremendous benefit. Uh, can I answer that question as well? Um, when I first was doing the research and after I came back and I said, okay, this was a profound experience for me personally, does that mean it has to become a per professional experience for me personally, right? And so I wrote down, you know, what, what is it that I would hope to accomplish? Uh, I wrote down in two years, if I'm sitting in a, in a restaurant in, in Kiev with a partner who I hadn't met Deb yet, 
you know, and, and a team, what are we celebrating, right? Like what are our big successes in the last two years? You know, trying to get another way to, what are we trying to achieve? And then I wrote down all of the reasons why I wouldn't want to do this or why this would not be a smart decision personally or professionally. And those were the red flags, right? And then I went through each of them over time to understand them and they flipped most of them to green. And I was very careful to be, starting a venture investment firm is a 10 year commitment at a minimum, right? You're taking money from investors, you are pledging you are committing yourself, you are on a mission to return a multiple of that, you know, ideally a significant multiple of what they put in. And so you wanna make sure that you're in that for the long run and that you've made a solid decision. So having made plenty of mistakes in the past, I wanted to make sure to avoid as many of them as I could. And looking at talent flight was certainly one of those. And I don't know where the statistics are lie, uh, lie now, uh, but a year ago, uh, something like 82 or 86 percent of people who had left had returned and people don't understand certainly in the United States that you know Ukraine during the era of the Soviet Union was the was the intellectual center of the entire empire and even before that if you understand history it was also the social and political and economic center of the Soviet Empire and in fact the capital of what was conceptually then, Soviet Union, right before it was Moscow or St. Petersburg. And um, there are so many universities mm. in this country and uh, that are kicking out, I think, quote me on this because it's been a few weeks since I looked at the number, but I think it's like 50,000 yeah, 50, new highly qualified personnel in information technology every year. And the size of your population, even if you, even if those people never come back, you will have replaced them in like five or six, you know, 10 yeah. years mm -hmm. or, or something like that. And you will, by the way, have passed Israel in raw numbers of highly qualified IT personnel in like six years or something like that from when I was looking at the numbers. So I'm less concerned about flight. I don't blame somebody for taking advantage of a bad situation to make their lives better. And I don't put a demand on them to return home, but I'm also not Ukrainian. It's not my place to really even have an opinion on that. But there are enough people here who have stayed and enough obvious indicators to me that the country is going to do nothing but grow and evolve that I would be okay with that diaspora knowing that they're still in their hearts Ukrainian and they still care very much for the country and will do what they can to support it. It's not like they left because they don't want anything to do with this place. Can you share in more details your plan for the nearest future in for a green flag venture in Ukraine? You can absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, uh, yeah so uh, green flag ventures. Uh, we're a, a venture capital firm uh, based in both Los Angeles and, and in Kiev, where Deborah lives. Uh, we invest in early stage uh, Ukrainian tech companies. Um, uh, specifically targeting uh, dual use, so capabilities which have a commercial and a military application, uh, cybersecurity, uh, AI uh, uh, and ML, uh, fintech, and uh, I worry a little bit that we're spreading ourselves too thin on this one, but I'd really like us to, to also include climate and green energy when we find the right companies, because how can you not <laughs> like it's the biggest problem facing the earth. You don't have to like it for it to be true. So I would like to, to, to make meaningful steps towards that. And so our intent is to invest in um, on the order of 12 to 15 or 20 uh, Ukrainian businesses over the next three to five years uh, and help them grow. And, and one of the things that is one of the, several of the green flags that make us believe that we're in best suited to do this and that the opportunity is there is you know my experience or our collective experience in u.s government selling into large commercial industry in the united states uh my relationship with the tech ecosystem and the fact that as a founder and somebody who has supported the ecosystem for years there are a lot of folks out there who are willing to help and who are looking for innovative solutions to their problems and if we can bring those things from here to the West, 
you know, there's been a, more than a 50% drop in, in foreign direct investment into Ukraine since the war started. But the tech ecosystem has grown more than 24%, which by the way, is not only impressive by itself, but you also have to consider it was growing 30% year over year for the, like the seven or eight years prior to that. It is on fire. Uh, it needs access to the markets. These founders need help reaching buyers and they need help with their pitches. But you can teach somebody how to pitch their product. You can't teach somebody how to be innovative. And so what I see are tons and tons of innovative people who are building products and, and, and products that they haven't even thought of yet. And it's a phenomenal opportunity for us to not only do really well by helping these companies grow through exposure to the markets, but to do the right thing. And Deborah's experience with the Ukrainian startup ecosystem is, might be also quite helpful here, as I understand. Yeah, you know, I, I, Justin and I sort of balance each other very well in terms of the different skills and the different bases of contacts and, and things that we have. And so just the the exactly the last six years, specifically within the ecosystem, I've actually got a pretty good understanding of uh, figuring out who's out there looking for um, sort of the very specific opportunities that we're going to be looking for and being able to do the, you know, quick evaluation, quick understanding, and then running it through kind of the normal process of evaluating a startup just like anybody would. I've been fortunate, you know, as a, as a founder to have investors who are very supportive and they help in ways that they promised that they would. Many founders out there who take capital from an investor, it's just money, it's dumb money. They don't provide any support and that's not what we wanna do. And that's not where we can help the most. So we, you know, it's not just the capital, it's the capital plus all of the, all of the value that we're bringing. And that's, that's why we're so confident we're gonna succeed here. I think that's perfect ending of our conversation. And I'm so thankful for you to this positive view, extremely positive view in this tough time. I think this is something that's inspiring, not only for, for uh, international audience, but also for Ukrainians who sometimes think in this world that, oh, like we see so many bad things happening, but we uh, every day and thanks to this helicopter view, we can see much broader uh, our future. Thank you for that. And thank you thank and you have a great time. Thank you so much for letting us join you.